Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see all of your beautiful faces, to see the names I know and love, and welcome to those of you who I don't know. I'm Richard, the rector, and I'm coming to you live from my um, newly improved home office. And for the first time in probably six months, I'm standing while I'm worshiping with you all because I invested in a new desk and it moves up and down. I've gotten on that bandwagon that many people have been talking about. It feels good to feel uh, dressed up for church. I even have my shirt tails tucked in today. So I'm all ready to preach for you. If you notice that the Bible lesson we just read from Paul's letter to the Romans sounded a bit different today than it does normally, you'd be right. Uh, today we read from the Message Bible Translation, a uh, well-beloved version of the Bible put in everyday language by the late Eugene Peterson. We normally use the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, more scholarly and accurate, keeping to the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of the texts. I chose the Message Translation today because I just felt that the text just came alive in a way that I was struggling with, to be honest, when I was looking at the scholarly version. The truth is, I have a love-hate relationship with Paul. Uh, I, I try and I understand that his, his theology is so foundational to our faith, um, but sometimes the language is dense and complex, and you really have to sift through. And Romans, like uh, more than all of his texts, uh, is, is this kind of magnum opus of, of his writings. It's the longest uh, letter that we have from Paul, and many people claim that it is his magnum opus that encapsulates his great arguments for faith. Today, I felt that this message, really, if there were any day that I didn't need to preach at all, but to just have this text in front of us and let this be God's living word that's speaking to us, across time and space than today is that day, because it seems to speak so poignantly to the moment we find ourselves in, when this pandemic is not over, and in fact, we don't know when the end will come. We're in month six or so, and we're learning as days go on that it really did not have to be this bad, that our country could and should have done better to prevent loss and death. We're in this season when students are returning to campus only to put themselves at great risk, and still other younger students at home, along with their parents and teachers, are preparing for another season of online learning, which brings its own challenges. This season when the election, as of today, is 72 days away, and the vitriol and discord have never been higher. When America's original sins of colonialism, white supremacy, and chattel slavery are more front and center than ever, God's living word speaks to us through Paul's words today to say, here's what I want you to do. Take your everyday, extraordinary life that you've learned to live and adapt to during these crazy times. Take that life, your sleeping, your eating, your Zooming, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture, meaning, don't become so well adjusted to this pandemic, to the injustices of this world, to the fact that it had to be this way, to the idea that it's never going to get better. Don't get so well adjusted that you fit in without even thinking about it. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around us, dragging us down to its level of immaturity. God wants the best for us. God wants the best for you. 
God wants to develop us into the full stature of Christ. When I read these first two verses, I, I, I get that our everyday witness, our everyday efforts count. And we're called to fix our attention on God, not, not this world. I've also learned that discernment never ends. We are constantly trying to discern what God wants for our lives. And I believe God speaks to us through our feelings. And when we get in touch with how we're feeling, when we're happy, when we're sad, God's speaking to indicate where God wants us. God wants the best for us. And each and every season, it seems once I reach some decision, I'm facing the next. I'm always seeking God's guidance rather than what this world and the culture around me would say. Paul's context when he's writing to the Romans originally is writing to uh, a church or actually many churches in Rome that predominantly were made up of Romans, meaning Gentiles. And of course, conflict arose that Paul's usually addressing in his letters. And the conflict scholars believe in this case that an increasing number of Jewish Christ followers were joining the Roman communities. And of course, wherever Gentile and Jewish Christ followers were mixed together, there was always conflict around circumcision, around whether you have to follow all of God's word from Abraham and Moses in order to be a full Christ follower, or whether if you're a Gentile, you need to start from scratch and just follow Christ. Paul speaks into that conflict with the central argument of today's passage about us being members of the body, the body of Christ. And Paul speaks about our worth being measured by God's goodness, not our own efforts. I love this part when he reminds us that it's important not to misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. My friends, I get in the trouble the most when I'm going 100 miles an hour and I'm convincing myself that all of it depends on me, that my worth is measured by how many things I accomplish in a given day. You know, we call grace amazing because it's unearned, it's undeserved. God loves us for who we are, not in spite of ourselves. I need to relearn, as I've been conditioned in life, that my worth has already been established. When we come to this argument about Christ's body, the point is that Paul's saying to the Roman churches and to the ancient world in which he preached that through our baptism, we are all made equal in the eyes of God. So he uses this great uh, analogy of the human body. It says each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. And the body we're talking about is Christ's body, the church, us. And each of us finds our meaning and function as part of this body. As a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, Peterson writes, we wouldn't amount to much. But since we find ourselves fashioned into all of these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or by trying to be something we aren't. When I meet with people who have joined our community at St. Margaret's more recently, at least within my tenure of serving as a priest among you, St. Margaret's diversity and inclusion is always cited as one of the reasons why people are drawn to make our community their spiritual home. For many of us, St. Margaret's is the most diverse community 
that we've ever been a part of. And as we talk about a lot, our diversity is our strength, but it's a challenge. It takes intentionality, and we are not perfect by any means. We are called to further inclusion, but this symbol of the body is written right into what we say our purpose is as a pair, to help people thrive as members of the body of Christ in our diverse and inclusive worshiping community. Our baptism makes us all equal, which is why we worship with other people from all kinds of socioeconomic levels, races, backgrounds, sexualities, gender identities, we all have a part to play. And we all depend on one another. And the way that we've been throwing around this phrase throughout the pandemic, we mean it for real, deep down, theologically, in our bones, when we say that we're in it together. When one of us is hurting, all of us are hurting. And so Paul concludes today's lesson to just say to be what you've been called to be. If you preach, just preach. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your sail. Keep a smile on your face. In other words, be yourself. Discern your own role. And as I've learned, our role changes season by season. And whatever you do, do it with love. In this time, what I'm feeling the most need of is grace. Grace to mess up. Grace to get it wrong. Grace to start over again each and every morning when I renew my commitment to this way of love, this way of following Jesus imperfectly as it is through my efforts, knowing that the grace that is so amazing showers upon me each and every day. And as I try and live out this faith that I'm constantly renewing, I'm so thankful to be doing it in community with all of you. And that is the gift of our community. As diverse as it is, as opinionated as we are, but deep down as loving and open, we all have a part to play. And we all have a lot of grace, I hope, to give one another in the days ahead. We're going to need each other more than ever. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad we're able to continue worshiping together for these new ways. Thanks be to God. Amen.